Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the people. Remember the wonderful works he has done, his miracles and the judgment he uttered. Look to the rock for which you were hewn and the quarry from which you were dug. We gather together to remember, to once again tell the wonderful stories of our God, stories we have heard so many times before, and passed down from generation to generation, stories of faithfulness and love and mercy and compassion and miracles and new life. Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. We welcome you to this service of remembrance brought to you by the Pennsylvania Southeast Conference of the United Church of Christ. We are gathered here at Salt and Light, formerly Grace Christian Fellowship in Southwest Philadelphia. I'm joined today by our conference minister, Reverend Bill Worley, and our associate conference minister for search and call, Ms. Susan Manasian, Reverend Dr. Susan Manasian. We will start now with an opening prayer. Join me if you would. Good and gracious God, Lord, here this morning, as we offer you first a prayer of thanksgiving. The word tells us in all things we ought to give thanks. So Lord, even during these times of separation, sequestering, and these moments when we are not able to gather together in our sanctuary, we still give you thanks. For Lord God, you have more than anything else been good to each and every one of us. The situation may not be how we want it to be, but we are grateful that every morning we see new mercies, grateful that every day we are showered by your blessings, grateful for the churches and pastors of our conference. We are thankful, Lord, for the ways in which we continue to be your church during this period. Hear us this morning, God, as we say thank you for those that leave their homes every day and purposely put themselves in harm's way. We thank you for doctors and for nurses. We thank you for construction workers, for fast food workers. We thank you this morning, God, for those that work in toll booths. We thank you for all those who are essential, for the butcher in the grocery store, for the teller at the front of the store, God. Those people, Lord, continue to work so that our lives might be easier. We thank you for the sacrifices of nurses and EMTs and police officers and firefighters. Lord, for all those who press forward, not so conscious even of their own health, but more conscious of their contribution to our society, God, we say thank you. Lord God, we thank you now for this service. We thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit. Hover over us for a little while is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from Ecclesiastes, the third chapter, beginning in the first and reading through the eighth verses. Ecclesiastes, chapter three, beginning in verse one. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to sprout. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. Thus ending ends the reading of the word of God. We are now going to have a selection by Mr. Gene Burke, who is our Minister of Music.
attended my way when sorrows like sea billows roll whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say it is well it is well with my soul it is well with my soul it is well it is well with my soul though satan should buffet though trial should come let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and have shed his own blood for my soul it is well with my soul it is well it is well with my soul Let us pray. 
O oh, gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts will be acceptable to you. Our rock, our redeemer, and the one who lets us know it is well with our soul. In 1965, the song Turn, Turn, Turn was released by the Beatles. I was seven years old. Having a sister who was 11 years older than me, that she exposed me to music I would never have listened to otherwise. While I didn't know then what I know now, the words of that song and later the words from the wisdom literature of the Hebrew Bible became meaningful to me. The tune of the song is catchy. The meaning of the words are reassuring, even the parts we don't like the parts that follow the comma in each sentence, because I learned to understand that those parts describe what humans do. We die, we plant, we kill, we break down, we weep, we mourn, we throw stones, we have to refrain from embracing, we loose, we throw things away, we tear, we're silent when we should speak, we speak when we should be silent, we hate and we create war. It isn't that I'm glad that humans are so flawed, it is that in spite of what we do, in spite of the reality of our flawed nature, our limitations, what we do that brings harm to others, God has also created us to be better and to do better. And so we're reminded to also be people who don't forget that there is a time when we are born, plant, heal, build up, laugh, dance, gather stones, embrace, seek, keep, sow, keep silence, speak, love, create peace. There is a time when all of these things happen in our human existence, and in the midst of it all, in the midst of every season, even in the season of a pandemic, God is with us. The negative, painful and broken aspects of our humanity do not have the last word. As I live into Memorial Day weekend, I like to remind people that this is not Veterans Day. This is a time of remembering a memorial to those who have given their lives to defend and protect. Now, I have been an activist most of my life. I have been anti-war all of my life. And yet I know given the way we are as humans, we will always have wars. My father was a ranger in World War II. He was a part of the reconnaissance group that located Mussolini and secured his capture. After the war, my father needed care at the Veterans Administration and he encountered barriers for what he needed and saw soldiers who were black not get what they needed. So he became disappointed by the system of the VA. He was so angry one day, I'm told that he took his, all of his medals and he threw them in the trash. He was so angry at the injustice of the injustices post-war. He didn't want to have anything to do with the symbols that reminded him of a time when so many people, so many of his brothers and sisters gave their lives so that it, there would be no other war. It was a war to end all wars. He died in 1963 with shrapnel still lodged near his heart from his time in Italy and later Korea. It couldn't be removed in those days. It wasn't, though, until our conference minister, the Reverend Bill Worley, left to serve as a chaplain with the Marines in Iraq that I spent any time really sitting with what Memorial Day means for those who are left behind in their season of mourning. I was the stated supply serving his congregation that year until he could return. And my first Sunday was Memorial Day weekend. And I learned that they had a color guard as a part of that service. What was I going to do? I was protesting the war, and now I had to preside at a service that elevated it? But I was so very wrong. 
I spent a lot of time in prayer and discernment and realized that it is a time of mourning, not a time of celebration. I had to get with it and understand what time it was. As the service started coming together, the prayer for those who had served and remembering those who died in service was turned into a moment of lament, healing, and anointing of the veterans in the congregation. Their painful memories were obvious on their faces as the anointing of oil was marked with the sign of the cross upon their foreheads for healing. I preached not only about my father, but other family members who then went on to the next generation who fought in Vietnam. I even asked my brother-in-law to read my sermon to make sure as a veteran who lost many friends that the sermon was okay. We then paused to pray for our own pastor, colleague, and friend who was serving in yet another war. Coming from a people Armenians who endured genocide by the Ottoman Turks. That was the prototype, genocide was the prototype for Hitler's pogrom. Death is something all too much a part of my familial story. And yet I always have to remember what time it is. Even in the worst seasons of our lives, Jesus, the one who was the incarnation of God, came at the right time. Did he also die at the right time? Did he resurrect at the right time? That's not for me to judge. What I know for sure is that he is in my life all the time. And he is always present at just the right time. I trust that even when I don't feel God's presence because of whatever human emotion I may be experiencing, I know he is present. Because no human emotion or experience can outweigh or ever bring us totally down. Or, if it has, he is the one that lifts me up. There is no pandemic that will ever end the power of God in our lives. There will never be a time when the Eternal One is not with us. This is indeed a time of mourning and perhaps dancing a lament. Not only on a weekend when we remember those who have died in military wars do we stay there. We also have a tendency, if you're of anything like me, to then remember that one death, remembering of one death, reminds us of other deaths. We remember those who die because of different kinds of wars, like the war on drugs or the war on poverty, the people that have died in that. We remember those who die senseless deaths just for breathing, for existing, for living while black. We remember those who die because of famine and disease or from violence at the hands of a stranger or family member. We remember those who die because that's what happens to us. We remember. And we remember also that people die sometimes because our worst selves are revealed. But we must always remember what time it is. It is always time for our best selves to appear, to be a people of resurrection power, to live with hope in the midst of despair, to live with love in the midst of hate, to live with promise in the midst of the crucifixions of our lives. What time is it? It is time, it is the season for humanity to be boldly loving and just and bring about the season of transformative liberation for all of God's people. What time is it? I'll tell you what time it is. It's time for us to mourn, yes. And to remember there is a season of all that is good, holy, and sacred, and it is time for us to hear how God is calling on us, even now. I know that whatever God does endures forever, and this pandemic is not of God. But what we do with it, when we are bold and loving, is of God. Our resilience is of God. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken away from it. 
God has done this. God has equipped us to be our best selves even in this season so that all of us can rise in awe before God. That's what time it is. May it be so. The word of God for the people of God. Ashe and amen. Grace and peace to you, my dear friends, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am Reverend Bill Worley, blessed to be the conference minister of the Pennsylvania Southeast Conference, the finest of the 38 conferences of the United Church of Christ. Blessed to be here today in the home of Grace Christian Fellowship, to be surrounded by brothers and sisters and siblings all in the spirit of the resurrected power of Jesus Christ to say hello to brothers and sisters and siblings from around the conference, from Schuylkill Association to Philadelphia Association to the North Penn Association to the Covenant Association and our friends in the Ursinus Association. God bless you all. I am so very grateful to Reverend Sean James and the friends that we have here at Christ Christian Fellowship for making this time possible, for creating this service in response to a need from our pastors around the conference to take a break, to have a Sunday Sabbath for themselves, and to give themselves an opportunity to pause and breathe in the Holy Spirit that they've been breathing out for so long and so well over these last difficult months of COVID-19 breathing. I have a few announcements to share about our gathered conference life. First, our June annual meeting, which should have happened next weekend at the Inn in Reading, has been postponed, and it has been created a one-day annual meeting on Saturday, August 15th at Zwingli United Church of Christ in Southerton, Pennsylvania. Hopefully, by the middle of August, we will be in the green zone of Governor Wolf's recovery plan. But if we are not, we will Zoom together. I have not yet been on a Zoom call with more than 250 people, so I would very much look forward to that if that's how we gather to see all those beautiful smiling faces. Second, Thursday, June 4th is a training day for pastors all around the conference, boundary training, diversity training, continuing education. If you haven't signed up, please go to the conference webpage Type in June 4th, and you'll find all the information you need. Looking out into the future, our fall conference meeting is November 15th at New Goshenhoppen United Church of Christ. Please pray with me that by November 15th, we are in the green zone and back at it. Can I get an amen from the seven people in this room? Amen. amen. Lord have mercy. And... I will continue our conference-wide Monday morning Zoom calls at 11 o'clock until we are in the green zone so we can continue to share our best ideas and to support and encourage each other through this COVID time. All these announcements and more are part of our Penn Southeast e-news that comes out via your email every Tuesday morning. If you're not on our mailing list, just type in PSEC e-news in any search engine. It'll take you right where you need to go to get registered. And as always, this service, the services of our conference, the work of Susan Manasian, Sean James, myself, and our staff is all provided by our church's wider mission. I have heard great stories in our congregations how generosity has not gone down as the COVID virus has gone up. I pray a prayer of thanksgiving for all of you who are members of our churches throughout the conference who have continued your spirit of generosity in this time and have made sure that the ministries of our churches, congregations, and ministry settings have not faltered in the face of the disease. Thank you and bless you and may that generosity continue because for certain, God's generosity is going to continue for us. 
bless you. Gospel reading from John, the 15th chapter, beginning in the ninth verse, ninth verse, John 15 and 9. As the Father has loved me, so I love you. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that you may have my joy, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Another selection by Gene Burke.
stronger. Lord, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. be to God. I invite you to join me in a spirit of prayer. Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks and praise this day for the good word that comes to us from the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Pray now that the Holy Spirit would join us across time and space, across the digital world, across the world that is God's world, to join us as one people with one heart and one mind with one spirit in one body, in the name of the one, by the power of the one and in the spirit of the one, who has died and raised and brought glory to God and all God's people. Hear us now, O Lord, as we meditate together on your holy word. In Jesus' name we ask this. Amen. I want to add a couple of scripture verses from John to what we share with Reverend James shared with us in John 15. Beginning with the 13th verse, no one hath greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends. Because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. You did not choose me. I chose you. Yes. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you want, whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Before Jesus heard what he needed to hear from the Father, he called the disciples, the people listening to this farewell that Jesus speaks. He called them servants. Now, I don't, I don't recall in the scriptures Jesus calling the disciples his servants. Students, maybe. Maybe servants of the living God, but certainly not servants of Jesus. But I get the impression that Jesus is trying to make a distinction here. He is not calling the disciples servants any longer. He has heard a word from the Lord. And with that word, he has instructed them. And by that word, he and they have changed on this journey together such that they are now friends. After Jesus hears a word of the Lord, the disciples become friends. And after they become friends, they have a choice. They can do as Jesus would ask them to do. They can go and bear fruit or not. They can follow Jesus' command to love one another or not. Have you ever been commanded to do something in your life you didn't do? Ah, uh, confession time now. Life is a series of before and after moments that are marked by the choices we make in the middle time. Life is a series of before and after moments that is defined by the choices we make in that middle time. Right now, life is happening for high school and college graduates who are not going to get to walk in their graduation ceremony. Our hearts break for them, for all of you that are listening. 
there is definitely going to be a time in your life where you will talk about your life before the time that you graduated and after the time you graduated and how different your life was because of the choices that you are making right now. There is a time before, every parent will tell you, a time before having children and a time after having children when life is different based on the choices you make. God bless you parents at home listening to this right now that are parenting small little children. God bless you to stay in that balance and keep your sanity. You will get through this. There is a before and after getting married. <clears throat> before you get married and after you get married, there's some choices in there that are going to determine how you live married for the rest of your life. There is before retirement and after retirement. And I hear from folks who have retired, and I hope someday to get there, that life before retirement is very different than life after retirement and the choices you make in between no matter how you're going to live. There's life before the death of a spouse or a parent that is very different than life after the death of a spouse or parent. I hear from brothers and sisters and siblings who have lost parents that life after a parent dies feels like being orphaned. Life is just different. And for friends that struggle in these pandemic days with addiction, when we are isolated and cut off from the very best resource that we have to fight addiction, no matter what that addiction is, is each other. It's being in contact with each other. There is life before addiction. There is life after addiction. And the choices made in the middle determine how li your life is going to go. On this Memorial Day, I remember that I defined my life before I went to Iraq and the time after I went to Iraq and the choices that got made in the middle. Before I even joined the military, I heard the stories, as Susan talked about from her family, from my father who was in the military and my grandfather who was in the military and my great-great-grandfather who was in the military. The men in my family were in the military. That was part of our story. That was life before I joined the military. There was that expectation that already lived that I was going to be in the military. And I made a choice. I made a choice to serve. And I made a choice in a time of war to serve. And during that time, I served as a military chaplain. I had on my right collar the symbol of Caesar, my rank device, and on my left collar, the cross. A constant reminder for me that I was doing exactly what Jesus commanded me not to do, and that was to try to serve two masters. My ministry in the military was very simple. I prayed for people. I got people together. I have to tell you, it wasn't too much unlike being in the time of a pandemic, being cut off, being distant, being scared all the time, wondering when you were going to get hit or get affected. Wondering when your number was up, when death was going to come to your house. It was a dry time. It was an exhausted time. It was a time of working 24-7. It was a time of doing new things and creating new ways to be in worship. It was ministry in a very dry, dry land. Now, before that time, I always thought to do ministry, you needed to have some really good music. You needed to have a sound system. You needed to have hymnals. You needed to have pews. You needed to have things projected on the wall. That was church. You needed to have that for church. But what I learned about ministry in the time of war was that all you needed was two or three people, a word from the Lord, maybe a song in your heart, and about five minutes to call on the name of Jesus. After that time, being a military chaplain in a war zone, I learned that church 
can happen in all kinds of ways. And I am so very excited that in this time we are learning the church is happening in all kinds of ways. So I define my life now before Iraq and after Iraq. And like the disciples before they were friends of Jesus, it wasn't until after his resurrection that they learned they were being carried through that time before I went to Iraq. I understood in my head the concept of being carried by Jesus through that time. After my time in Iraq, I knew that Jesus was carrying me through that time. We are in, right now, a before and after time. We are talking about what life used to be like before the coronavirus. We are now wanting to talk about what life is going to be like after the coronavirus. What I don't want us to miss is that before the coronavirus and after the coronavirus, Jesus is carrying us during the coronavirus. Before and after. Before the coronavirus, we thought church had to be a certain way. We had to be all together. We had to be in pews. We had to be able to sing together. We had to do music together. We had to have Bibles together and hymnals together. We had to have scripture reading together and liturgy together. We had to be together. And what we are discovering is there are all kinds of ways we can do church. I hope that what we know before the coronavirus gets changed by the presence of the Holy Spirit during the coronavirus so that after the coronavirus, we are going to continue to find new ways to do church, to be the body of Christ, and to reach out into the world. Somewhere before Jesus leaves the disciples in the time after his resurrection, they decided they were going to follow Jesus' commandments. They decided they were going to follow the commandment to love. Now, what I would like to tell you in this in-between time, this before and after time of coronavirus, I'd like to give you all a commandment. I'd like to give you all a commandment. Your conference minister would like you to be commanded to stay home for the next four weeks, at least until June 4th. In fact, if your conference minister could give you a commandment, it would be don't go back to worship until we are in the green zone but I am just the conference minister. I am surely not Jesus. So I cannot command anything, but I will commend you to John 15, verse 17, that if we truly love each other, if we really care about each other, if that is what we are going to do in this in-between time, is to practice love while we are still distant, then that commandment from Jesus is going to be guidance to us that the best way to practice love right now is to be as safe as we possibly can to protect people and to not get together before it's got to happen. Because what happened in the before time is shaping what is happening now in this middle time, and it is going to affect what we do after this time. And after this time, what I hope is that this distance that has kept us so far apart this social distancing that's been impacting our spiritual distancing is going to make us so hungry that after the coronavirus, we come together so close as friends that we never want to let each other go, not ever again. That on Sunday when church is over, we hesitate long before we walk out the door. Life is a series of before and after choices that determine how we live the rest of our lives. Brothers and sisters, on this Memorial Day Sunday and on every Sunday, I pray and I hope that we will live by Jesus' commandment to love one another as he loved us, as I love you all. Thanks be to God. We are grateful to all of you who have gathered with us during this season. 
want to take a moment right now to offer a prayer during our service at this time. We would consider this an altar prayer. And to all of you all who are worshiping with us in your homes, I do not know your names. I do not know the specific situation that you would bring to the altar this morning. But I pray that you would gather around whatever altar you are able to construct for you and your family as we pray right now. I am certain that when Jacob was in the wilderness and he lay his head on that rock, that he could not get to a church. And so the Bible tells us that right where he was, he called that place Bethel, the house of God and that there he spoke to the Lord. And wherever you are right now, just like Jacob, you can make that place a Bethel, a house of God, where you can pray. We are praying for all of our churches in our conference, but look further than that. The churches of our, con of our national denomination, but look further than that. The churches of this nation and this world, but look further than that. For beyond even just our family of Christians, we pray for the world, for those who are affected by this time, this virus, those who have to make important decisions during this season. As our conference minister said, we pray for our pastors and for wise discernment, for there are important decisions that must be made in the next couple of months concerning when to gather and how to gather and how we can do that safely. And so we pray this morning for pastors and consistories and church leaders that must make life-changing and important decisions about the continuing of our worship. We pray this morning for those who are in hospitals, those who are both in hospitals because they are sick and those who are in hospitals because they are serving, for mothers that are going into hospitals to have children but must do so without the father present for those that are going in the hospitals for reasons unrelated to COVID-19, but yet here they are. For all of those situations, for all of those names that you are uttering right now, we are praying and healing in the name of Jesus. We pray for prisons where there are COVID-19 outbreaks. We pray for uh, workers in prisons who are exposed because of that. We pray this morning for our teachers who are on the computer all day long now, teaching class after class and then giving one-on-one -on -one tutoring to students. We pray this morning for those displaced, those unable to pay their rent, those searching for food. This morning, we bring our concerns before the Lord and we leave them there. The same God as Reverend Worley and Reverend Dr. Manajan just came but told us the same God that got us through that time is the same God who is getting us through this season and is the same God that will get us through the season to come. So God, we offer to you this morning our prayer, certain that you can heal, certain that you can deliver, certain that you can set free. We take our hands off of it and we leave it at your altar. For if we've learned nothing else in this season, we have learned, Lord, that we are not in control and that we must give to you that which you deserve. You are in control. You have our best interests in your heart. God, we pray right now that you would move over this land. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to ask our conference minister to come back and give us final words and words of benediction. I want to say thank you so much to my colleagues. I have been blessed to have such wonderful colleagues in ministry, uh, Reverend Dr. Susan Manajian and Reverend Bill Worley. We thank God for all of you who are using this uh, either for your Memorial Day service or service afterwards. And we pray that you would stay connected with us in this conference as we do the work of God in Southeast Pennsylvania.
And again, a word of gratitude to friends here at Grace Christian Fellowship for hosting this event and giving us this opportunity to be together, to come from this house to your house on this Memorial Day weekend or on one of the Sundays that are following, that we can still be connected in the body of Christ throughout our conference. So on behalf of Reverend Sean James, our Associate Conference Minister for Congregational Development, our Interim Associate Conference Minister, Reverend Dr. Susan Manasian, who is uh, our ACM for Search and Call, and for the rest of our conference staff, we pray that God would keep you and bless you, be safe and well, and receive this blessing from the one who was, who is, and who is to come. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit bless you and your family, your church, your community, your congregation, and keep you safe as we move into a very uncertain future by the very certain promise and presence of our resurrected brother in Christ, Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.